Nephrotic syndrome is a collective term that we use for glomerular disorders that are characterized by massive proteinuria. When patient, due to some reason, loses more than 3.5 grams of proteins per day into the urine, it's a nephrotic syndrome. The reason why a person can suddenly begin to lose proteins into the urine is usually due to the damage to podocytes, which can cause a decrease in negative charge of the glomerular barrier. So, the major feature in diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome is to determine protein urea greater than 3.5 grams per day. What is also important is that losing of proteins into the urine is not accompanied by losing of red blood cells, because the only possibility how red blood cells can enter into the urine is due to the damage to glomerular basement membrane, which happens in nephritic syndrome. But in nephrotic syndrome, the integrity of glomerular basement membrane remains intact, and because of this, red blood cells cannot leak into the urine. So, in case of nephrotic syndrome, we have to determine proteinuria without hematuria. To explain this, here we have blood compartment, it's a glomerular capillary, and kidney compartment, which is Bowman space. And in between we have a specific structure that we call glomerular barrier. The first component of the glomerular barrier are endothelial cells that have negative charge. The second component is the glomerular basement membrane that have negative charge. And the third component are podocytes that also have negative charge. We also call podocytes epithelial cells. And also, glomerular barrier have mesangial cells. The function of glomerular barrier is to provide filtration. Let's take for example water, kidneys like water, and glomerular barrier has excellent permeability to water. We have to know that the major driving force that pushes substances from the blood compartment into the urine compartment is the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. Exactly, hydrostatic pressure creates the major driving force of filtration. So, what is hydrostatic pressure and why it's important? So, here we have a little bit bigger picture. We can see afferent arterial, glomerulus, afferent arterial and Bowman space. Blood is delivered by cardiac output to afferent arterial. After this, blood goes into the glomerulus where, as we already know, filtration into the Bowman space occurs. And fluid that enters into the Bowman space after reabsorption will be excreted into the urine. Fluid which is left after filtration goes to the efferent arterial. The most important process here is filtration. And filtration is determined by several factors, like glomerular filtration coefficient, by the difference in hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus minus hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman space and by oncotic pressure. The major factor here is hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus. And we know that hydrostatic pressure is equal to weight of fluid divided on area. Weight is equal to mass on gravity and mass is equal to fluid density times fluid volume. The reason why we go into the details is to determine the major factor that affects hydrostatic pressure, which is fluid volume. For example, person has fluid overload. Increase in total amount of fluid in the organism will cause increase in cardiac output. As a result, the amount of fluid that will income to the afferent arterial and hence to the glomerulus increase. With increase in fluid volume in the glomerulus, the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus increase. With the increase in hydrostatic pressure, glomerular filtration rate increase. This will cause increase in filtration, and thereby the higher volume of fluid will income to the Bowman space, and hence to the urine. So, as we see, hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus is the force that pushes substances through the glomerular barrier. But there are some substances that we do not want to see in the urine. All these substances have negative charge. Let's take podocytes as one of the glomerular barrier components.
other sides also have negative charge. And as we know, the same charges repel each other. And this creates electromagnetic force. So, because negatively charged substances and polar side have same charges, this creates electromagnetic force that repel negatively charged substances from polar sides. But at the same time, we know that there is always hydrostatic force that pushes substances to the glomerular barrier. In normal condition, the electromagnetic force is bigger than hydrostatic force, and because of this, negatively charged substances cannot come close to the glomerular barrier. But when injury to podocytes happen, this will cause weakening of podocytes' negative charge. And because it's negative charges that create electromagnetic force, this will cause diminishing of electromagnetic force. And now, hydrostatic force that pushes substances toward glomerular membrane will be bigger than electromagnetic force that repel substances. And in this scenario, negatively charged substances can come close towards glomerular barrier, and some of them can even leak through the glomerular barrier into the urine. So, in the blood we have proteins, let's take albumin. And proteins have negative charge. And also we have red blood cells. And compared to proteins, red blood cells are huge. So there is significant size difference between proteins and red blood cells. And as we'll see further, it's very important. The force that pushes proteins towards glomerular barrier is hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus. The force that repel proteins from the glomerular barrier is a collective electromagnetic force created by negative charges on podocytes by negative charges on glomerular basement membrane and by negative charges on endothelial cells. And this collective electromagnetic force is bigger than hydrostatic force. As a result, proteins cannot leak through the glomerular barrier. So, in normal condition, we do not see any proteins in the urine. With the red blood cells, everything is simple. The pores in the glomerular basement membrane are too small for them. So, because red blood cells are very large cells, if glomerular basement membrane is not affected, they cannot leak into the urine, simply because the space in the glomerular basement membrane is too small for them. So, nephrotic syndrome is characterized by massive proteinuria with absence of red blood cells in the urine. And there are several pathologies that can cause nephrotic syndrome. The first one is minimal change disease. We have to know that minimal change disease is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. So, if a child has nephrotic syndrome, typically it's due to the minimal change disease. In adults, minimal change disease can be caused by lymphomas. Typically, it's a Hodgkin lymphoma because Hodgkin lymphoma cause massive production of cytokines, which can damage podocytes. And the signature feature of minimal change disease is excellent response to glucocorticosteroids. Because among all disorders that cause nephrotic syndrome, only in minimal change disease they can markedly improve the condition. So, let's explain how minimal change disease cause nephrotic syndrome. In the blood we have pro-inflammatory cells. And some conditions as infection, immunization, or lymphoma as Hodgkin lymphoma can cause activation of pro-inflammatory cells. And once they become activated, they begin to produce massive amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The problem is that pro-inflammatory cytokines are toxic for podocytes. Once cytokines bind to podocytes, they can cause effacement of food processes. First of all, it's caused podocytes deformation. But also, with loss of food processes, podocytes lose their negative charge. And the negative charge of podocytes is one of the key elements in electromagnetic force that repels proteins from the glomerular barrier. With loss of podocytes negative charge, the electromagnetic force decreases. And now, hydrostatic force that pushes proteins through the glomerular barrier 
becomes greater than electromagnetic force that repels proteins, and in this situation, proteins will cross through the glomerular barrier into the Bowman space, and then we will excrete them into the urine. And important that proteinuria will be massive, greater than 3.5 grams per day. And what about red blood cells? As we see, glomerular basement membrane remains intact, which means that the space in the glomerular basement membrane remains too small for red blood cells. So, because red blood cells are two large cells, if glomerular basement membrane remains intact, they cannot cross glomerular barrier, which means that we won't find any red blood cells in the urine. In case of minimal change disease, we give patient glucocorticosteroids. They will cause apoptosis of pro-inflammatory cells, which will cause decrease in cytokines production. And with decrease in cytokines, podocytes will regenerate their food processes, they will restore their negative charge, and everything should come back to normal. In minimal change disease, light microscopy is normal. So let's recall how normal microscopy looks like. Here we have glomerular basement membrane, which forms this thin line. Also we have mesangial cells, there is podocyte, and here we have endothelial cell. Immunofluorescence won't show anything, but on electron microscopy we can determine effacement of podocyte food processes. So here we have normal podocyte that has a lot of food processes. There is glomerular basement membrane, and there is endothelial cell. Normally, podocytes are separated from each other. So, what happens in minimal change disease? Here we can see red blood cells in the capillary lumen, which is normal. There is endothelial cell, and there is glomerular membrane, which is also normal. What is abnormal here is podocytes. Look how flat podocytes look. Basically, what happens is that podocytes lose their food processes and they merge together. On next image, there is also endothelial cells, basement membrane, and basement membrane is covered by podocytes. But podocytes do not have any food processes. Exactly this state we call effacement of food processes, and it's a characteristic feature of both minimal change disease and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. On this image, we can see glomerular basement membrane, which is covered by podocytes with a lot of food processes. But on next image, we can see effacement of food processes, where food processes basically merge together and form one flat mass. With time, food processes will detach. This will create a bare glomerular basement membrane areas. On these three images, we can see the progression of food processes effacement. On the first image, we can see distinct food processes. On next image, food processes look flat, and some of them merge together. And on last image, even more food processes merge together, and as we see, they look even flatter. The next pathology that causes nephrotic syndrome is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. For examination purposes, I suggest you to memorize that if person has bad habits as multiple sexual partners which can cause HIV infection, or history of IV heroin use, or he has significant obesity, and such person has nephrotic syndrome, most likely, the reason is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. In addition to this, it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in patients with sickle cell disease. So let's explain how focal segmental glomerular sclerosis develops. In some cases, the pathogenic factor that triggers disease is circulating permeability factor. And in this case, we call it primary focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. But typically, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is a secondary pathology that develops in patients that has HIV, history of heroin use or significant obesity. 
these factors provoke production of two groups of substances. The first substance act on podocytes and cause podocytes deformation with effacement of podocytes food processes. The second substance stimulates mesangial cells and with stimulation mesangial cells become activated. First of all, effacement of podocyte food processes cause loss of negative charge on podocyte surface. We know that podocyte's negative charge is one of the key elements in electromagnetic force that repels proteins from the glomerular barrier. With loss of podocyte's negative charge, the electromagnetic force decreases, and now hydrostatic force that pushes proteins through the glomerular barrier becomes greater than electromagnetic force that repels proteins, and in this situation proteins will cross through the glomerular barrier into the Bowman space, and then we will excrete them into the urine. And important that protein urea will be massive, greater than 3.5 grams per day. And what about red blood cells? As we see, glomerular basement membrane remains intact, which means that the space in the glomerular basement membrane remains too small for red blood cells. So, because red blood cells are two large cells, if glomerular basement membrane remains intact, they cannot cross glomerular barrier, which means that we won't find any red blood cells in the urine. But as we see, in addition to this, there is activation of mesangial cells, and mesangial cells begin to produce a lot of collagen, and the massive secretion of collagen by mesangial cells cause sclerosis of the glomerulus. Important that sclerosis is focal, which means that for example out of four glomeruli only one is affected by sclerosis, and segmental means that in this affected glomerulus sclerosis affects just one segment. On light microscopy we can determine sclerosis and hyalinosis. On this image we can see normal glomerulus, and right next to him, we see glomerulus with massive sclerosis. But in affected glomerulus, there is still some area where collagen depositions are absent. So sclerosis has segmental pattern. On next image, we can see normal glomerulus. And right next to him, we see glomerulus with segments of sclerosis, which is a signature feature of this disease. Immunofluorescence typically is negative, but in some cases it can show some focal depositions of immunoglobulins. For example, on this image we can see this focal bright green areas, which means that there is local deposition of immunoglobulin M. On electron microscopy we can determine the effacement of podocyte food processes. On this image we can see flat podocytes without food processes, which tell us about effacement of food processes. And also there is ring cage of the capillary wall, which tell us about sclerotic processes. So focal segmental glomerular sclerosis on electron microscopy looks very similar to minimal change disease. So for example on examination they will give you electron microscopy image where you will see effacement of podocyte food processes, and this patient will have nephrotic syndrome, and they will ask you what is the cause. In this case, you will look at response to steroids. If steroids markedly improve condition, it's minimal change disease. But if steroids are not effective, it's focal segmental glomerulus crosses. The next pathology that causes nephrotic syndrome is membranous nephropathy. Membranous nephropathy can be primary due to the antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor, but more commonly, membranous nephropathy is secondary pathology. For examination purposes, you have to know that membranous nephropathy is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in patients with severe infections, as hepatitis B or C or syphilis. It's also the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in patients with lupus. 
So if person with lupus has massive proteinuria without red blood cells in the urine, the cause is membranous nephropathy. But if in patient with lupus there are red blood cells in the urine, it will be nephritic syndrome. And in this case, the cause will be diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. And also, membranous nephropathy is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in patients with solid tumors. So, for example, if patient has breast cancer and nephrotic syndrome, the causative factor of nephrotic syndrome is membranous nephropathy. Very important is that membranous nephropathy has the highest risk of thrombotic complications among all pathologies that cause nephrotic syndrome. So, if you will see nephrotic syndrome and patient has renal vein thrombosis, for example, most probably it's membranous nephropathy. So, let's explain how membranous nephropathy develops. So, in some people, immune system recognizes phospholipase A2 receptor as antigen. In response to this, B lymphocytes begin to produce antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor. In other cases, infections, lupus, or intake of drugs can provoke B lymphocytes to produce antibodies against them. In both cases, antibodies will bind to antigens with formation of immune complexes. Immune complexes will lie down right under the podocytes with formation of a so-called subepithelial deposits. The problem with immune complexes is that it's a very reactive and dangerous substances. Basically, it's like a bomb that can be activated in any moment of time. To prevent potential toxicity of immune complexes, glomerular basement membrane basically envelops them. First of all, it will cause increase in thickness of glomerular membrane. But in addition to this, it will displace podocytes, and such displaced podocytes will not effectively provide their negative charge for electromagnetic force. So with time, in this fashion, immune complexes begin to deposit right under the podocytes, and in response to this, glomerular basement membrane will separate immune complexes from podocytes by enveloping them. So, the first consequence is increase in thickness of glomerular basement membrane. Also, deposition of immune complexes will give granular pattern on immunofluorescence. And also, enveloping of immune complexes by basement membrane will cause typical spike and dome appearance on electron microscopy. Spikes are formed in between immune complexes and domes are formed above the immune complexes. The reason why membranous nephropathy will cause nephrotic syndrome is because displaced podocytes cannot provide their negative charge. With loss of podocytes negative charge, the electromagnetic force decreases, and now hydrostatic force that pushes proteins through the glomerular barrier becomes greater than electromagnetic force that repels proteins and in this situation, proteins will cross through the glomerular barrier into the Bowman space, and then we will excrete them into the urine. And important that proteinuria will be massive, greater than 3.5 grams per day. And what about red blood cells? As we see, glomerular basement membrane remains intact, which means that the space in the glomerular basement membrane remains too small for red blood cells. So, because red blood cells are two large cells, if glomerular basement membrane remains intact, they cannot cross glomerular barrier, which means that we won't find any red blood cells in the urine. The key feature of membranous nephropathy is thickening of glomerular basement membrane on light microscopy. On the left, we see glomerulus of patient with membranous nephropathy where we can determine excessively thick basement membrane. And on the right is normal glomerulus. As we see, in normal condition, glomerular membrane is very thin. And we know that thickening of basement membrane is caused by deposition of immune complexes. 
Here we can see different stages of membranous nephropathy. As we see, initially, basement membrane is relatively thin. But with time, thickness begins to increase. And on third image, we can see how enormously thick basement membrane can become. On immunofluorescence, we can determine granular pattern. Why the pattern will be granular is because of immune complexes. On this image, we can see a typical granular pattern caused by immune complex deposition. And on electron microscopy, we will determine a spike and dome pattern caused by subepithelial deposits. On this image, we can see immune complexes, which are located right under the podocytes. Between immune complexes, we can see spikes. And in regions where immune complexes are located, we can see domes. Exactly this spike and dome pattern is a signature feature of membranous nephropathy. In normal state, as we see, glomerular membrane is thin and smooth. Here we can see immune complexes and the position of immune complexes form this typical spike and dome pattern. On this image, we can see different stages of membranous nephropathy. As we see, initially, immune complexes begin to deposit under the podocytes. In response to this, basement membrane tries to envelop them. This causes formation of a typical spike and dome pattern. And as we see, basement membrane becomes excessively thick. And it's a signature feature of membranous nephropathy. The next pathology that can cause nephrotic syndrome is amyloidosis. Amyloidosis develops in patients that have chronic inflammatory disorders, as ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, or inflammatory bowel disease. So, let's explain how amyloidosis causes nephrotic syndrome. Chronic inflammation in case of rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease provokes formation of amyloid. Amyloid likes mesangial cells. So, amyloid begin to deposit in mesangial cells. And actually, we can determine a significant deposits of amyloid inside the mesangial cells. In addition to this, amyloid is toxic for podocytes. Amyloid provokes podocytes apoptosis, and with death of podocytes, patient will lose podocytes negative charge. With loss of podocytes negative charge, the electromagnetic force decreases. And now, hydrostatic force that pushes proteins through the glomerular barrier becomes greater than electromagnetic force that repels proteins. And in this situation, proteins will cross through the glomerular barrier into the Bowman space, and then we will excrete them into the urine. And important that protein urea will be massive, greater than 3.5 grams per day. And what about red blood cells? As we see, glomerular basement membrane remains intact, which means that the space in the glomerular basement membrane remains too small for red blood cells. So, because red blood cells are too large cells, if glomerular basement membrane remains intact, they cannot cross glomerular barrier, which means that we won't find any red blood cells in the urine. We also have to know that we can determine the position of amyloid in mesangial cells by Congo red stain. And Congo red stain gives amyloid a reddish tint with apple green bioreferigens under the polarized light. So, in amyloidosis, light microscopy with Congo red stain is the most important diagnostic feature. On these images, we can see a reddish areas which are in fact the position of amyloid in mesangial cells. On the second image, we can also see massive depositions of amyloid. And on this image, we can see amyloid depositions as reddish tint with apple green bioreferigens under the polarized light. When you see such picture on examination, it's amyloidosis straight away. And the last disorder that can cause nephrotic syndrome is diabetes. And there are two mechanisms how diabetes can cause nephrotic syndrome. First of all, it's glycation of proteins, and the second mechanism is more complicated. 
diabetes cause hyperfiltration. So let's explain how diabetes cause nephrotic syndrome. Diabetes cause increase in hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus. And the increase in hydrostatic pressure cause hyperfiltration. So we have to understand what is hyperfiltration. Previously, we discussed that the major factor that determines filtration rate is hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus. And in turn, hydrostatic pressure is determined by the volume of fluid in the glomerulus. Diabetes cause higher in arteriosclerosis. And mostly, arteriosclerosis affects efferent arterial. To explain the significance of this event, we have to know that flow from the glomerulus to afferent arterial is directly proportional to the pressure difference between glomerulus and afferent arterial and inversely proportional to resistance. And resistance is inversely proportional to radius to the force power. The problem with arteriosclerosis is that it causes narrowing of the afferent arterial. So it causes decrease in radius of the afferent arterial. With decrease in radius, resistance increase. With increase in resistance, blood flow decrease. So the lesser volume of fluid will leave glomerulus. This causes decrease in amount of fluid that incomes to the afferent arterial. And at the same time, this causes increase in fluid volume inside the glomerulus. With increase in fluid volume, hydrostatic pressure increase. And because hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus is the major driving force of filtration, with increase in hydrostatic pressure, filtration increase. As a result, more fluid will income to the Bowman space, and exactly this we call hyperfiltration. So, diabetes causes increase in volume of fluid inside the glomerulus. This causes increase in hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, and this state we call glomerular hypertension, which is a signature feature of diabetes. So, because diabetes causes increase in hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus, the force that pushes proteins to the Bowman space increases. So now we have this increased hydrostatic force due to the hyperfiltration. But also diabetes cause glycation of proteins, including proteins on endothelial cell wall. And because proteins give endothelial cells negative charge, with proteins glycation, negative charge disappears. Loss of endothelial negative charge cause decrease in electromagnetic force that repels proteins from the glomerular barrier. So decrease in endothelial electromagnetic force combined with increase in hydrostatic force due to the hyperfiltration, creates a situation when hydrostatic pressure that pushes proteins through the glomerular barrier becomes bigger than electromagnetic force that repels proteins from the glomerular barrier. And in this case, proteins will leak into the Bowman space and then we will excrete proteins into the urine. And important that protein urea will be massive, greater than 3.5 grams per day. As an additional feature, diabetes causes activation of mesangial cells. And activation of mesangial cells causes mesangial expansion. This causes thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, which is also one of the signature features of diabetic nephropathy. And what about red blood cells? As we see, glomerular basement membrane remains intact, which means that the space in the glomerular membrane remains too small for red blood cells. So because red blood cells are too large cells, if glomerular membrane remains intact, they cannot cross glomerular barrier, which means that we won't find any red blood cells in the urine. This time, mesangial expansion will cause glomerular sclerosis, this formation of a so-called chemal steel wilson lesions. Here we can see a small pink areas, which is in fact local nodular glomerular sclerosis. And exactly such sclerotic areas we call chemal steel wilson lesions. All disorders that cause nephrotic syndrome cause massive proteinuria. And because in all of them organism lose proteins, 
they all have the same pathological features that are related to protein loss. It's edema, hypoalbuminemia, increase in blood cholesterol, they can cause frothy urine with fatty cast, they induce hypercoagulable state, and they all increase the risk of infection. So let's explain how all these features develop. All disorders that cause nephrotic syndrome cause decrease in electromagnetic force that repels protein. As a result, the glomerular permeability to proteins increase, and now organism will begin to lose proteins in urine. In nephrotic syndrome, protein loss is more than 3.5 grams per day. One of the proteins are albumins. Loss of albumins cause decrease in oncotic pressure, which results in increase in extravascular fluid. And with increase in fluid in interstitium, periorbital edema develops. And with time, it can progress to anasarca, which is a severe and generalized form of edema. To correct oncotic pressure, liver begins to produce more proteins. One of such proteins are lipoproteins. Increase in lipoproteins production causes dyslipidemia, with increase in low-density lipoproteins that will cause increase in blood cholesterol, and with increase in very low-density lipoproteins that will cause increase in blood triacylglycerols. But the problem is that lipoproteins are also proteins. And because glomerular membrane becomes more permeable to proteins, we begin to lose proteins in urine. This will cause lipiduria, and lipiduria will cause frothy urine with fatty cars. Another problem is that we begin to lose antithrombin-3, which is a small protein that inhibits coagulation. Now, with loss of antithrombin-3, coagulation increase, and hypercoagulable state greatly increase the risk of thrombotic complications as thromboembolism. Usually, it causes deep vein thrombosis or renal vein thrombosis. And in addition to this, we begin to lose immunoglobulins. And because immunoglobulin G provides humoral defense against infections, with loss of immunoglobulin G, the risk of infections increases.